Hi, welcome to the last session of the day and of the conference. It's great to have you all here. This session is the um, nanotechnology and emergency response. Don't be afraid, be aware. I'm Donna Franklin. I work with the National Weather Service and I'm on the conference committee and really pleased to introduce this session and our speakers. Jeff Leifel is a certified emergency manager with more than 10 years of experience in emergency management and with seven years of experience specific to the Department of Energy and National Nuclear Security Administration in national security. He directs all hazards preparedness efforts for natural disasters, technological accidents, terrorist attacks, and other major events. Greg Nichols is the science and technology advisor for the Homeland Security Homeland Defense and Security Information Analysis Center, where he provides subject matter experience on nanotechnology and coordinates program activities. Previously, he supported occupational and environmental health projects for government and corporate clients and assisted with business development activities. So I'll turn the time over to these gentlemen. <laughs> all right, thank you. Uh, all right, let's see here. Um, all right, well, I kind of want to get a gauge of who's, who's heard of nano before they found this in the, in the session. Okay, cool. Anybody doing anything actively with nano in research or another capacity? All right, so you're, you're my phone a friend if you want to come on up and yeah. Okay. Um, all right, I got one other thing. Um, did anybody else try to turn off their containership alarm at 530 this morning? Because, okay, a couple, yeah, I, no, it didn't. And it was every 30 seconds. Um, for those that didn't hear, the, the fog had caused some pretty good noise for the ships to come in and over and over. So, OK. Um, well, I'm Jeff Leifel. Uh, I did our introductions there. Uh, we'll get started. Um, so of course, a good number of you guys have heard about Nano. And uh, Dilbert, no, no different. Dilbert's on top of everything. So. Uh, He's got a thing with nanobots that are going to you know, keep them healthy um, and motivated. And uh, unfortunately, Dilbert's always got that positive attitude. So he's like, you know, they're going to be disappointed. But uh, got to love, gotta love Dilbert. Um, all right, so what's nanotechnology? And why should emergency management care about it? Um, everybody, emergency managers, some flavor of in some capacity. I've had a number of public information folks I've talked to kind of outside of that, but okay. Um, that's good. Okay, uh, so naturally occurring materials, you know, obviously you're going to find those out there, and uh, nanotechnology is now taking that and manipulating those materials, uh, several of the different properties, and providing a uh, um, typically very different. Uh, reaction or um, makeup of what that naturally occurring material would be. So you've got material A and material A in a nanoscale, very different. Sometimes they don't overlap at all. Um, some of the main areas, the properties that we're talking about with the surface area and particle size, um, it is what you would call a dual use technology. Uh, as many times as we're going to come up with something good, a, uh, a beneficial use for a nanomaterial, there's that equivalent, the nefarious use for that material. So um, at the, you got your good and your bad, and you probably have uh, a lot of people working in both directions. Um, thankfully, we're going to talk about the good part first. Uh, Greg gets the, uh, the scary security part of it. Um, OK, just a little bit about properties. Uh, I'm not going to go into a, um, a scientific speak. There's no, there's no formulas that you have to remember. Uh, the, the easiest way I was trying to think of how to explain the differences is if you take gold and uh, you take the naturally occurring form of gold and you turn, you take the nano scale of it. Gold reacts in a certain way, we know what it's going to do. You take that nano version of it and as you shrink that size down um, and your overall particle size gets smaller and smaller, your electrons are bouncing all around in a smaller space and um, you can get very different reactions out of uh, um, whatever you're going to do with the material. So if you shine light through a gold solution or in a liquid solution on a different scale, so maybe a 20 nanometer scale, 
Um, it may show red. Drop it down further into a 10 nano scale or a 10 nanometer scale, and you may get green. Same material, different size, very different. What do I get now? So um, a lot of unknowns as we move through that, or I should say unknowns in the community that we're going to be talking about in a minute, well known in a research um, environment. Um, some of those results of changes. Um, up here, the, uh, one of the easier ones to talk about is the uh, carbon. Uh, in its naturally form, or it's a naturally occurring form. That material is uh, um, uh, basically not, it doesn't transport electricity very well. It's not conductive. Uh, diamonds, graphite, not going to have something that electric or electricity will pass through. Now you take that nano version of those same materials, graphine, graphene or a carbon nanotube, and you've now turned it into kind of an electricity conductor, a superhighway. Uh, so you've got a complete opposite here, still the same material, just different scale. Uh, you can look at that being the catalytic activity. Uh, I won't give, go through all of them uh, late in the day, but uh, um, really you can make that material do anything that you want it to do when you start changing those couple properties around. Um, for here, you got to throw uh, size does matter in a nano conversation. Um, although we're going smaller from up at the uh, uh, macro scale there, you're talking about basically us, animals, anything on a normal scale that you want to measure with a, um, a typical scale. As we th shink, shrink down through into micro and nano scale, um, we're getting into our viruses and our DNA, and that's kind of the home where nano lives in the 100 nanometer down to one nanometer. And then, of course, atomic scale below that. Uh, um, all right, I kind of went through that part a little quicker since I think everybody raised their hands about knowing nano. Uh, kind of gives you the level playing field. And to this point, most of what we are doing with nano is in a research capacity. Uh, the, the gaps and uh, the background that we didn't talk about in, uh, when I was introduced is I'm in the responder space, um, fire instructor, hazmat background. So I look at it very differently than the scientists sitting there doing the research, saying, all right, well, we're in our controlled environment. We know our volumes. Everything is very controlled. I see it on the side of the highway or in another capacity. So that's going to mean a lot different to me. And um, as we move forward into here, we'll start digging down into, let's get out of that research area, get out of that lab, move these things out into where you're going to come across them. Uh, in a normal, normal day. So the only constant is change. I think that's been a theme of previous uh, EM conferences and things. It's the one thing we can count on. And uh, the materials here, those are everyday materials up on the screen, but they all have a component, a nano component to them, whether you know it or not. Um, titanium uh, dioxide, that is a uh, um, material that on the nano scale provides your white material. So in your, um, in your lotions and in your sunscreen, it's white because of the titanium dioxide within that, within that component, making that a white material. So you have that, you're putting that on your skin, you're all, you know, you're happy, you're, you're blocked and uh, protected from the sun. Um, Under Armour, uh, those, those clothes have the titanium, they have the, um, what am I thinking, titanium, uh, silicon, silicon. Um, uh, silver, uh, nanoscale silver, sorry. Um, but within those material, it's actually woven right in. It's part of the, uh, the material when it's made, and that's a microbial. So that's improving your, um, your antimicrobial. So that's actually improving the, uh, um, the resistance or the uh, ability to, um, I'm trying to think, my, I lost my word for the, yeah, well, hey. Um, basically, it, it's, in the, it's in the fabric, and uh, then you move on to uh, cosmetics. Again, white, they have more than just the titanium dioxide in them. They'll have a, a whole host of different uh, materials that exist. But again, you're applying them to your body. Um, this is a, uh, um, a quick little, little video, um, kind of give you some comparisons between the materials that we do know about um, your heavy, your steel, 
uh, kind of moving in all the way up through carbon fiber and how those different materials uh, cause very different results in, in equipment. Let's see if we get... So really what we're just trying to show there is, uh, is as quick as we've got um, uh, the normal material in their normal environment and the fact that uh, you see at the bottom that's our normal plane, uh, the fuel efficiency is not there. Uh, there was a session right before this that did the alternative fuel vehicles and uh, uh, in there they were talking about all the different advances and then you see the hydrogen one in the car was actually just one of the middle of the road ones where they've it put advances on top of their advances already. So um, the pace that we're moving at, uh, it's just going to keep speeding up. So the time that we're trying to figure out what we're going to do with a response to something in this case, you're already, they're already working two, three, two or three things ahead of that. Um, uh, I do have one more thing for the food uh, because of course you know you're applying sunblock and stuff to your body. Now here we're consuming uh, nanomaterial. Uh, the glaze in those donuts is no different, so that titanium dioxide shows back up, and that's in your glaze to make your donuts white. So you have that white top over it. Um, and at, uh, uh, at one point, Dunkin' Donuts and others were using those, and within the last year, uh, Dunkin' Donuts had kind of a public outcry, no, hey, we're not gonna, you know, we don't want nano. Um, and it wasn't because that they knew exactly what it was, it was because they didn't know what it was. Nano was just scary, so we don't, you know, we don't even want to just, I don't even want to deal with it. So Dunkin' Donuts did actually go and change their recipe and are not using it at this point anymore. So, um, now, uh, um, the nano in the research environment is great, but here 
this is really out in the, the, the real world, commercial products. You've got over 1,200 uh, different facilities in that in some way or another, manufacturing, moving uh, ma uh, of materials that consume or that contain nanomaterial. Um, your makeups, your cosmetics, your everything that we were looking at earlier. And you'll see it's kind of a, all the way across the United States and um, as well as worldwide, don't think it's just us, with a concentration up there in the Northeast. But in order to get from A to B, they're gonna be over our roads, driving through our counties, um, possibly having wrecks, um, other things may go wrong. But nowhere do we have any of the pieces that we're gonna talk about here in a moment about what do you do when that unfortunate incidents just happened in your county. Uh, leads us into challenges, regulations, and responses. <clears throat> now, in here, I know we've got uh, um, a couple different things we're gonna start talking about. Um, if we wanna start with challenges up here at the top, uh, for health and the environment, if you wanna think of... Uh, oh. Yeah, so I'll take over just for a few minutes. Uh, this is more of where my research comes into play dealing with the potential health and environmental challenges of nanomaterials. Uh, as Jessica was saying, things on the nanoscale have different properties than they do in everyday life. Um, and so what happens is you get different effects. And we know through the research we've been doing over the past 20 years or so, that you might have similar health effects if you're looking at something with titanium dioxide on the average scale versus the nano scale, but those particles are smaller, so you might have additional health effects. Um, a lot of those models that we use to evaluate the toxicity or the risk of those particles, we don't have well-developed models for smaller particles. So we're still trying to figure out what happens in the long term. And so that provides, as you can imagine, a lot of uh, very difficult things when you look at how to develop regulations, how to communicate that risk to people, and how to uh, do more research to see what is safe and what other uh, measures we need to take. Um. Yeah, we, uh, um, since we were both kind of at those opposite ends and uh, research being the one that's well known and that responder gap, uh, we actually started talking about this um, over a completely separate project where uh, um, he's like, hey, I'm working on this and uh, you know, I really need to kind of want your, uh, want your take on it. And from a responder point of view, my first thing is, well, I don't have my ERG, my response guidebook, doesn't have any section on nano that I can ever find in it. So. Um, we go to the tools that we know as responders, and none of those, although you'll find gold and things in there, or um, chemicals and things in there that you would want to respond to, nothing is going to tell me about it when I've just changed it into something on a nano scale. So I said, well, you know, what, what exists? And uh, he's like, well, that's the problem, because you can go and search on it, and although Google will bring you back millions of responses on everything else, here you have a really hard time coming up with some good good list of information that will help you in this kind of response. Um, you, um, uh, you're not gonna, uh, they're not just gonna appear. It's not gonna be something that will just work on day one. Now, some of the materials may respond very similar, but um, as a firefighter, you have um, foam on your truck, you've got water on your truck. Now, that normal material may or may not be reactive with that water all of a sudden if you've changed its properties? You don't know. Um, there aren't really tests being done at that level. Uh, most of them still maintain themselves within the, the confines of just regular research. Uh, so we found this, this big void and it's like, all right, well, let's, um, let's see who's interested in this and, and what else could we do with it? Um, small, small agency, Department of Transportation, you know, it's like, well, you know, that's not really something that, uh, they're gonna do at the moment, it's, well, you've got, our, you've got what you know, continue to use that until we find out a reason that that's not working. You know, um, a lot of times you'll get asked, you know, what's that, give me an example, give me a nano incident that means that we need to go and respond to this. Greg will give you some examples later that it didn't happen until it happened. So if you want me to wait around to the nano incident, okay, but it, it could be really bad. Uh, for the most part, the general statutes they don't have anything that specifically will go and call out, this is how you do something in a nano response, as opposed to this is how you would do it in the typical response we do nowadays. Uh, let's see, where's my, my list? 
Or you want to do the EPRA and if you want to do any of those, right? You could, yeah. So um, as Jeff was saying, a lot of the regulations that currently exist are pretty general to maybe um, hazardous materials or to you know emergency planning, things like that. The general consensus in the nanotechnology community when you look at a regulatory scheme is to take what we already have and try to shove nanomaterials the best we can into those frameworks. For the most part, that works for now. It starts to break down when you get to things such as hazardous waste because when you look at something like RECRA, the Resource uh, Conservation Recovery Act, it doesn't apply to household waste. So materials like cosmetics and things like that are being thrown away from somebody's home wouldn't necessarily be covered by that statute. Um, also, the toxicity testing measures that we use for those frameworks don't really work very well for nanoscale particles, so you can't get accurate uh, toxicological information. So it doesn't quite fit. Uh, recently, the uh, EPA just passed um, some amendments to the Toxic Substances Control Act, TSCA, under Section 8, which covers uh, the significant new use rules for materials and now is going to require that um, manufacturers of products that contain nanomaterials are going to have to register these materials and provide some information uh, that's going to hopefully provide some more details of, of what we need. We're kind of hoping in this community that the, up, the amendments to TSCA will provide a better regulatory and toxicological framework for nanomaterials, but that's just one aspect, right? Because then we have transportation, we've got uh, the FDA, we've got all these other sorts of things that, that we still need to kind of think about. And so for right now, we're just kind of maintaining and hoping for the best. And that's where it kind of gets a little dicey, as Jeff was saying, because, yeah, nothing has happened yet, but if something does, then it's like, wow, what do we do now? Um. Well, yeah, and, uh, and some of the things we we're thinking of different scenarios, and a lot of them fly under the radar because of either the quantity we're talking about or the nature in which it's released into an environment. And um, one of the ones that we had was just, you know, the household product picked up in your garbage. Your garbage truck's got all kinds of other stuff in there. It's all pressed down, possibly leaking as you're going down the road. Uh, at what point is that actually going to be an environmental issue? Uh, I don't know. It depends on what's leaking. But... Um, all of those are definitely, they're not, those aren't things that are on any of the agency's radars just because, you know, it's, it's a garbage truck. What could possibly, you know, just be leaking? It's nothing. Um, so those are the, and kind of an endless list of different options. Um, and for the responses and the um, impacts and examples there, um, my next slide, oh, well, I'm down a couple yet. Uh, we are talking about different types of responses that uh, those first people on scene are going to be experiencing your law enforcement, your fire, your EMS. Um, you now have vehicles. We were talking about carbon and carbon fiber. And these components are now in several of the vehicles. You've got BMWs. They're built several carbon fiber parts along with a whole host of other vehicles. Um, you get, they get in a wreck. Uh, you may be a wreck with a vehicle fire. So you may have some of these components that are on fire. Depends on what they're releasing. Um, law enforcement typically would be your first ones out on scene. If there's a person in the car, they're going to go in there, whether they're protected PPE or not. Um, inhale a little bit of it at this point and then get the person out. Now, EMS is not going to have a lot more PPE until the fire department's there with you know, breathing apparatus and everything. Uh, so they're going to have exposures at you know, various, various different points in time. Um, different vehicles, never going to think twice about it. You're not supposed to breathe in a vehicle fire, but there may be other things that are at work here. So um, not just the fire side, you've got a regular uh, accident where you have to cut on a car, uh, extricate somebody, and you're cutting through a carbon pa uh, graphite panel in a vehicle. And you've now released little particles, some of it in dust form, so you've got an inhalation a hazard. Um, so there's all kinds of different routes of, uh, of these things going really wrong, and until we just, or, thinking it's like I haven't heard anybody bring it up at a fire department training hey we're gonna go through this um, we go through special training in hybrids but yet to go through different responses to something like a nano uh, incident um, oh, now we'll kind of we'll kind of go out beyond just those responders and get a little bit into our um, private and public uh, government at that regulation level and then everywhere in between um, 
I don't know if you want to go first on there or second. Yeah, one thing I think that um, Jeff and I really noticed, when you get beyond the first responders, uh, what happens if there is a large casualty incident and now you have a medical system that's being flooded with people who have been exposed to, let's say, uh, carbon nanotubes, right? Most medical providers, probably 99.9%, aren't going to know what to do. If there's anything special that they have to do, they're probably going to call their state poison centers to try to figure it out. They're probably not going to know what to do. So it's just a big gap that we've kind of noticed. Uh, Jeff and I are both from Ogres, Tennessee, where uh, we have um, a facility, radiation emergency assistance center and training site, which responds to uh, radiation emergencies around the world. And so Jeff and I have thought, like, the things that they do at REACTS is what this facility is called, but is a lot of management specifically related to radiation casualties and so there are people trained in that but we don't have anything like that for nanomaterials again because nothing has happened so nobody's thinking that way but if something were to happen you know that would be a huge gap and can you imagine the strain that it would put on not just the medical community but phone lines trying to figure out you know who to call and what to do and so that's that's a huge area and then a public of course you know communicating that risk what the people need to know when do they need to know it how do you even explain nanomaterials to the average person so those sorts of things that we haven't thought about yet but we we need to get close and start thinking more about how we would deal with these issues when they happen um, <clears throat> yeah with the uh, um, going all, from medical waste to uh, um, the processes that you would be doing for uh, any kind of chemical response beyond your agency, you're gonna, you've got Cameo, you've got Chemtrek, you've got a whole list of numbers that you're going to be calling, you've got trucking companies and, and um, SDS uh, uh, data sheets that are going to have information about materials, possibly not the nano version of the material, but um, all of these are things that you're going to, alright, I know what I'm going to call for this type of incident. The times, times are the essence and you have no idea at this point. There isn't that. So every time we that oh, you know, maybe we're getting somewhere, you, you uncover the next page and they're like, well, no, that doesn't help either because Chemtrek doesn't know anything about their nanomaterials. So um, not that they're not working on it, but it's not a well-known point at this time, or at this point in time, it's not well-known enough so that, you know, the 2016 ERG that came out, it doesn't have a section for this. So um, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of interest there on our side, but then on the public side, like he was mentioning, is the public is going to hear a couple things like, oh, that's a big scary incident. Well, um, don't tell me what's going on in the incident. Tell me if I'm dying. What do I need to do? Do I need to turn off HVAC and put a towel under the door like this? Or is there something completely different? Um, those are the kind of messages that the public cares about. That's the only part they're going to hear. Um, and of course, I have social media on there because, uh, well, that's what everybody turns to. And uh, the couple things you do find on Nano when you start digging around, um, I won't say that everything on the internet's true. You know, I mean, that's the that's the way that goes, right? If it's public or if it's out there, it's real. Uh, but that's where your public's going to start going if we don't have answers before that. So, um, dangerous and good all at the same time. Uh, all right. So, recognizing and preparing for those incidents before it occurs. Uh, it's a recurring theme is the before it occurs because every time we've had a conversation or started a conversation with, well, what about nano? They're like, well, give me an example. And unfortunately, it's uphill to get that beyond the, well, give me an example. Um, it's not, uh, uh, it's not, nobody's going to go here and say, all right, you know, we'll, we'll fund you, we're going to do all this, and, and you just tell us when you've got an answer. Um, they're not going to make it that easy. So, Instead of having the, here's an example, we've kind of gone around that and said, um, well, what do we have today? Is it adequate when we're talking about PPE, the techniques that we use to respond to incidents we do know how to respond to, and then methods of fire suppression and other types of, uh, of um, offensive actions or offense actions, um, are they going to work? So. With, with this, I gave you the carbon example for a vehicle, so passenger vehicle, um, not going to have any kind of placarding saying that there's a, a, a hazard on board. Um, I know from NFPA uh, 704 you do have placarding and there's that threshold of so many gallons before it's considered something you placard, but in this case you're, you're never going to see a placard on a vehicle saying there's a nano type uh, material or component to it. So. 
Uh, that example is one. Uh, Greg's got a, uh, a different example with airplane here and, uh, and where that could go horribly wrong. So we're not really just talking about over the road experiences. <laughs> Yeah, we're not trying to scare you. We just want you to be aware. But um, as many of you know, a lot of the newer um, models of airplanes are made of either completely carbon fiber in their fuselage or components are made of carbon fiber. Uh, Boeing has several uh, models that actually have carbon fiber in them. The problem with carbon fiber, it's, it's relatively inert. It's perfect. Like once you make it, it's not going to break down. The problem is when it comes under a very high impact and you get uh, heat, such as a, a fire with a very high temperature, right, then it begins to break down and you release the resin that holds the carbon fiber together. So now you have a secondary exposure, right, because that, that resin starts to break down and it causes um, uh, fumes to be released. So if you have a, an airplane that's made out of carbon fiber and it's flying, it's fine. But when it crashes from 15,000 feet, the impact that it makes is going to disrupt that carbon matrix and cause the resin to release. And so when first responders get on site to a plane, a plane crash like that, right, it's going to be a very different experience than if they were fighting a plane crash where it was just an aluminum fuselage. So it's those sorts of things as technology, you know, advances we need to think about all the components that we put in the products and how that's going to change our response. Um, so it's not all, it's not all bad. Uh, we're also thinking of the, um, uh, what kind of applications can you take with nanotechnology to help improve those uh, types of responses or possibly the, um, the equipment that we're wearing in order to go into these type of environments. And uh, um, we keep going back to carbon nanotubes and there's a, um, a multi-walled carbon nanotube where it's actually going to help improve the flame retardancy of, of clothing. So um, at the same time we're going to have to combat it this is a way to kind of help us in that in that respect. Um, so, you know, one up, one one point for the responders for uh, for just helping with the retardant uh, for clothing, but then also the uh, sensors, um, nano, of course, a small sensor, and um, they've been utilized in uh, in military and other where they're going to be using them for uh, surveillance. You can be parts in drones. I mean, when when we shrink that down, we've got a lot more opportunity. So um, in a military type environment, in a response type environment where your, um, your nano sensors are able to more quickly identify hazards, uh, exposures, um, you take it into the medical field and you've got um, implants, monitors, heart monitors and others that are also on that same scale. So it is, it is advancing in the medical field. Um, no, no, where do you start? <laughs> where, where do you start after? Oh, here, you get the spec. We'll, we'll trade spots. All right, so I guess I get to, I get to start. So, <laughs> so Jeff gave you a very brief overview of nanomaterials, how they're currently being used, why we as the emergency management community need to be aware. We're going to talk about how we start making all of us aware, and then I'm going to get into the really scary stuff. So please stay tuned because it gets better. Um, so first of all, just attending things like this, what Jeff and I are doing, right? Being aware, being aware that nanomaterials are out there, they're being used, that you as emergency managers, first responders, uh, government officials, right? That you have a, a duty and a responsibility to understand how technology is changing and how that will affect you and those that you're responsible for. And then along with that is providing that training. Okay, so now I know, so what? What do I do about it, right? So incorporating the idea of nanotechnology and advanced materials into training scenarios, right? Making sure that people have adequate information about how to handle those risks, what those risks are, and how to protect themselves. Um, and then we talk about personal protective equipment, as we all know, right? It's a very big and important part of our jobs. Um, Traditional things like glove gowns, masks, they might be adequate for some things. Nanomaterials, it's a little bit different, right? Because now we're dealing more with these very fine particles that can be inhaled. So you have to take um, additional respiratory protection. So this is where you need to consult somebody like the National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health, right? NIOSH has a lot of information on how you can protect your workforce, your first responders, yourself uh, from nanomaterials if that's something that you're, you're dealing with. But as you go forward, equipment that you may not have kept on your fire trucks or in back of your police cars or something like that in the past might be something that you have to start keeping 
um, on board now. So just kind of things that, to think about as we go forward. Uh, some other things that we can start doing, and this is more of the, um, the public health, the, the epidemiology, if you will, understanding how the nanomaterials will affect workers, the community, the first responders, all right? So collecting data, exposure data, and um, conducting studies, as we do with a lot of exposures in the past, right? But gathering that information to understand what the health effects could be, what the risk is of somebody getting an illness if they're exposed to something like this, and how we can adequately protect them, right? We're, we're moving towards this era where we have evidence-based practice, so we need to start gathering that evidence so we know what to tell people to do. We might not need to tell them to do anything differently, but we don't have enough data to tell them one way or another right now. So we need to continue to collect more data so we can give uh, first responders and other people in the community the best information they need to know to protect themselves when it comes to nanomaterials and nanotechnology. And then of course that data will eventually be used in these regulatory frameworks to fill in some of these gaps you know, that I mentioned earlier. So now we're gonna talk about some security aspects, and by this, this is code word for terrorism. So we're gonna talk about, just was saying, we've got the good and the bad, right? And in some cases, the ugly, but we're gonna talk more about the nefarious uses of nanotechnology. And so why do we, why do we need to know? We'll, we'll get into that in a, in a minute here, but when we look at security and those aspects of nanotechnology, we're talking about three different things. Um, as Jeff mentioned, you know, we have things like nanosensors and some of the protective clothing flame retardants that are made in nanomaterials. So we've got aspects of nanotechnology that can be good, that can improve security measures. We've got aspects of nanotechnology that can be a threat. And we're gonna talk about some of those in a minute, right? How do we take something that might have a legitimate use in medicine and turn it into a biological weapon, right? And then we have something I don't think people have really thought about, but now that we have all these nanotechnology facilities, these high-end user facilities, uh, research centers, things like that, how do we keep those safe? Um, back, I think it was in 2010, there was actually a, a rash of bomb threats and some successful attacks in Mexico on recent nanotechnology research centers, right? So how do we start thinking about protecting those assets? So as Jeff mentioned, and I mentioned a couple times, nanotechnology is a dual use technology. And what we mean by that is for every legitimate use of nanotechnology, it has an equivalent to a, a bad use and nefarious use. So for an example, nanomaterials are being used as pharmaceutical delivery systems and especially in targeted cancer therapies, right? Right now, the current practice is usually to give somebody chemotherapy that wipes out all the good cells and the bad cells, makes them very sick. With nanomaterials, we have um, the ability to actually target specific cancer cells and take the medication that we need to fight that cancer cell and direct it right to that, that tumor. That sounds amazing, and it is, right? But we can also take anything, it doesn't have to be a chemotherapeutic agent, we could take a chemical agent, we could take a biological agent, right? And we could do the same thing. We could you know, target somebody's lungs with a specific agent like anthrax, right? So imagine, yes, we're taking a good use, but we're using it in a bad way. Okay, so these are some of the things that are now becoming possible with some of these advanced technologies. So let's talk about why people started thinking about the bad stuff to begin with. So back in 1986, there's a gentleman by the name of Eric Drexler who wrote a book called um, Engines of Creation. And basically in this book, he talked about um, these small machines, these molecular machines that could basically replicate themselves and within a matter of days, we'd have like trillions and trillions of these little molecular machines that would cover the earth and they would outweigh the earth and it would destroy us all, right? So we call this thing the gray goo and that freaked people out. So people started thinking, man, nanotechnology could be really bad, right? Um, later on, Bill Joy, who was the president of uh, some microsystems, wrote this article, Why the Future Doesn't Need Us. And again, he talked about how as we create more advanced technology, eventually we're going to um, kind of wipe our species off the face of the earth, right? Because the machines are going to take over and all these other technologies are going to make us obsolete. Um, and then in 2002, the novelist Michael Crichton writes a book called Prey, where he talks about, I believe, the, the nanorobots, right? Um, around the same time, it might have been in the late 90s, uh, if anybody remembers the X-Files, 
Uh, there was an episode, okay, there's an episode where uh, Agent Skinner had some nanobots injected in his heart, and the terrorists were able to turn the switch on and off, right, and stop his heart. So that freaked a lot of people out, and people started thinking about, man, what if this stuff really happens, right? So for a while there, nanotechnology started to go along the ways of genetically modified organisms where people were like, man, we got the gray goo, we got these nanobots, this is really bad stuff, right? So things kind of came, I would say to a screeching halt, but things slowed down a lot. Um, and then it really wasn't until about 2007, 2008, where the research mindset in the United States anyway kind of turned away from let's see how fast we can develop things to let's slow it down a little bit and let's evaluate the health and safety and environmental aspects of nanomaterials, right? So now we have a more robust body of research looking at the health and safety aspects. But something that I think is kind of developing recently is uh, looking at the aspect of terrorism, right? How can we use these things for weapons? How can we use these things for terrorist attacks, that sort of stuff? <clears throat> And unfortunately, as humans, we will take anything and make it into a weapon. If you've seen the movie 2001 A Space Odyssey where the chimpanzee takes, I think it's like a, a bone or a stick and he beats another chimpanzee with it, right? That, that's just what we do as human beings. Anything that can potentially be used as a weapon, we're going to figure it out. As we, as we continue in this age of, of terrorism, uh, we see the rise of ISIS, we see the rise of other you know, um, groups, they're catching up with us in terms of their technological uh, superiority, if you will. I think ISIS is um, their whizzes at social media, right? I mean, I just opened a Twitter account like a year ago, and I know, like, I couldn't do anything for them because I don't know what to do with Twitter, right? But they're using these uh, forms of social media to recruit people in a way that nobody's ever seen anything like that before, right? And that's just one aspect. Uh, we'll talk some more about some of these other nations that are doing advanced nanotechnology research and how their capacity is catching up to the United States and what that might mean for us. Okay, this is my favorite slide, I think, of the whole presentation. Yes, I, thank you, everybody looked up, I love it. So, so if you think that Jeff and I are just here wasting your time, I hope that you'll reconsider because we really need to think about going forward, not just how are we going to develop regulations and risk management and better frameworks to respond to nanomaterials, but we need to also think about what happens when that first nanoterrorism incident happens, because it will, it will at some point. And the reason it will is because history tells us it will. So 1346, you see the black and white picture, right? A Mongol army lay siege to the city of Kaffa in the Crimean Peninsula. Sometime after the siege, plague breaks out in the Mongol camp. Not being one to give up, the Mongol commander orders that the bodies of the dead soldiers are catapulted into the city of Kaffa, right? A few days after that, plague breaks out inside of Kaffa. Now, it's generally, it's kind of a myth, but it's believed that maybe this incident caused the Black Death that wiped out a third, you know, to a quarter of Europe's population. The point is, this is one of the first documented cases of the use of biological weapons in warfare, right? If you go down to the other black and white photo in the bottom right there, Georgi Markov, 1978, Bulgarian dissident. He was attacked in London with an umbrella that had a ricin pellet in it. He died a few days later, okay? And then the gentleman in the upper right, Alexander Litvinenko, a former Russian spy, uh, suddenly became ill one day in 2006 and later died. It was found that he was actually poisoned with polonium. It's a radioactive element. And so what do all these have in common? Well, they never happened until they did, okay? These are all the first uses of these exposures in these cases, right? Nobody, nobody thought these could happen. Nobody prepared for these, okay? We're at a much better stage, I think, now knowing what is possible, what human beings are possible of, what technology is capable of allowing us to do that we need to start thinking about the next thing. Could it be nano? Could it be something else? Probably. <clears throat> And just to drive this point home, this is um, a screenshot from an actual conference that I was invited to earlier this year. I did not go, I'll just put that out there. But um, one of the topics, if you can't see it, it's circle in red, is nano weapons. So 
this this is an actual conference, a real conference, a nanotechnology conference, and that is one of the topics. So, you know, I'm not making this stuff up. People are actually starting to think about these things. And so, people like China, Iran, Russia, right? They're thinking about these things too. And we tend to think about terrorism now. We've got these lone wolf incidents that have happened in Orlando and San Bernardino. We've got the incidents that happened in Paris and Belgium, right? We're just fortunate that they have been using conventional technologies, right? Like, unfortunately, the Nice attack was with a truck, and we had the Orlando shootings and things like that. But it was very possible, as China, Iran, and Russia are developing robust nanotechnology programs, that they could also be developing weapons that could be given to third party um, actors that could be maybe state-sponsored organizations that have access to you know technologies from China and Iran so it's very possible that something like this could happen in the near future right a nano incident that's either a weapon that was funded by one of these programs or a terrorist organization gets their hands on some chemical weapon that's nano enhanced from maybe research that's happened in one of these nations And so with all that said, we're kind of, we're starting to wrap up here, but this kind of culminates in something that's known as a black swan event. And I'm not sure if anybody's familiar with this concept. Um, it, it's something that was developed by a gentleman named uh, Nassim Nicholas Tlaib. He was a trader on Wall Street, and he was trying to figure out a way to explain how these economic crises happen, right? And he came up with what he calls black swan theory. Now. If anybody knows the history of black swans, um, it was thought up until I think it was the 18th or 19th century that black swans did not exist, that it was impossible, because it was Europeans writing about white swans. One day, somebody ended up on the shores of Australia, and guess what? They found a black swan. Completely changed their worldview. So that's how the, the name of the theory came about, right? So these are events that are completely unexpected, right? Events that um, caught us so off guard because our current models, the way that we think, didn't pick up on the possibility of something like this happening. So I think when you look at nanotechnology, nanomaterials, whether it's you know an intentional release through terrorism or whether it's an accidental release through maybe a fire at a factory that makes nano products, we need to start thinking about the impossible, right? Because it's very, very possible that something will probably happen in the next five to ten years. <clears throat> you want to take yeah. yeah well we'll do a couple takeaways here um i think jeff and i'll probably go back and forth so so for right now uh i think the most important thing we want you to know is that if you are a first responder yourself or deal with first responders um a nanomaterial incident is most likely to have a uh, inhalation risk as a primary hazard so be, be mindful of that and how you might protect the airway, whether it's through um, advanced respirators or full SCPA or something like that. Um, I think the other thing that's really important is probably the, the second and third points up there, right? That nanomaterials, because they are small, have unique properties. And because of those unique properties, they're going to act differently than, than materials we have on the average scale, right? So titanium dioxide is a really good example. It's used in a lot of paints and coatings and pigments, has been for a long time. Now we're making it smaller. Those particles are making paints and pigments whiter, but they're also um, more reactionary, so they have the potential to cause additional health ha hazards beyond what the normal titanium dioxide could potentially cause. Well, I, um, hmm. there was one. Uh, the, uh, you know, it's not all. It's not all hopeless um, with the exercising and, and training and preparedness that you do see going on, um, and that many responders are. are you know, it's already nor normal part of the program. Um, earlier this year, it was in the spring here, we were out in D.C. and had an opportunity to be part of a uh, tabletop exercise that involved uh, nanoparticle release. Um, in that aspect or in that um, uh, scenario they were using uh, pesticides and they were being released into a waterway and then it was run through of uh, um, you know what are you doing what are you thinking about where are your questions what's the public going to do about it um, the interesting part was this was a room full of scientists so they had a very research directed response to everything that was going on in there 
and um, it wasn't on that responder level. Again, there's the opportunity where we didn't know what the responders were supposed to be doing at this point, but what they are doing is they're running this through their head saying, all right, well, you know, this was just released into a waterway, so it's no longer in that, in that facility and under those controls that we normally have in place. So um, it, it's moving forward. Uh, that's the only exercise that I had seen that was going on specifically done for a, uh, for a nano release, but um, that's progress. And uh, when you get more of those to go on, you get more conversations, more people involved, more questions, a lot of the similar ones that we've been asking. So hopefully we're going to be seeing a lot more of it. So just to reiterate a couple points, so as Jeff was saying, just the one workshop that we went to is the only training that we're aware of that kind of specific nano component but i think it's important going forward that a lot of your scenarios when you do exercises you think about you know including something with nanomaterials or nanotechnology or some other advanced technology because probably at one point in the next i don't know year or so you'll run across something whether it's nanomaterials or carbon fiber or 3D printing or something, right? There'll be some scenario that you haven't planned for it that you'll be, be called to a, an incident for to respond. Um, and then it's important to continue to cooperate with stakeholders, right? Nanotechnology is a very complex topic and first responders, emergency management type folks in, in this community, we go out and we, we do stuff, right? We're doers. Um, but there's a lot of other people behind the scenes that can help. There are scientists that have information on toxicology. There are regulators who understand like maybe some of the things that need to be included. So it's just important to continue to talk to everybody um, in the different communities as shareholders. And then, um, you know, as the science evolves and the regulations evolve, um, incorporating those into your, your daily practice. I'm going to skip this. Jeff puts this up here to embarrass me. But uh, <laughs> so this is actually uh, this is a, a model I developed for uh, an occupational scenario, but it can probably apply in a lot of different cases. But basically, it's what do you do when you think you may have NATO or you're not sure if you do, right? So I, I guess the first thing would be that you have to identify any sort of process or materials that use nanomaterials and nanotechnology. In case of emergency management, you would be identifying maybe facilities in your area that produce nanomaterials or um, maybe a situation where somebody might respond to like a pesticide spill that could potentially have nanomaterials. So kind of thinking about those aspects. Um, and then evaluating your current practices. So how would you respond? If you've got a facility in your region that produces nanomaterials and there was a fire, how would you respond now? And is that gonna be adequate for dealing with nanomaterials or nanoproducts that would be involved in that factory? And then assess, you know, is that adequate based on the current guidelines? And uh, you can talk to me after, I can give you a list of resources that might help you identify some of those. Um, and then adjust, if you're not doing something that's up to snuff, fix it, right? Get a consultant, uh, call NIOSH, they'll come and they, they can evaluate your practices. So there's a lot of options that you have. And then finally, once you have this kind of uh, new model worked out, this framework, to communicate that to the community, to your workers, to um, you know, other people who need to know um, where nanomaterials are and what you're doing about it. All right, this is a quote. Um, ironically, he's the past president for the Institute for the Future, which I think is just really funny. But anyway, so uh, Roy O'Mara had said this, and we tend to overestimate the effect of a technology in the short run and underestimate the effect in the long run. And I think that's probably pretty true. And again, we want to thank you, um, and we'll be available to answer any questions that you may have.